So we've been talking about a lot of wars, right? We start off with a Chinese civil war, then a Japanese invasion of China that then turns into war in the Pacific slash World War II. And then we went back to the Chinese Civil War, and we're now ready to talk about the Korean War, right? And in order to understand the Korean War, we have to trace its roots back to both the colonial period and World War II. We'll first focus on World War II. In uh, Cairo in 1943, the Great Powers, uh, the Allied Powers, uh, issued a proclamation. This was like the United States, uh, the Soviet Union, and Britain that said, the fourth said three great powers, mindful of the enslavement of the people of Korea, are determined that in due course, Korea shall become free and independent. And this is really great from the Korean perspective, because this is saying that Korea, uh, even though it's technically a part of the Japanese empire, is not really at fault. It's a colony that should be liberated and should receive its independence. So from the perspective of uh, Koreans, in a part, this is good. There is something that makes Koreans a little nervous, though, because and it's those words, in due course, because this means that independence will not, will not be immediate, right? Independence will take some time. It's not until due course. Now, that's 1943. When the Japanese are defeated in 1945, the Japanese army does exist in Korea, and it needs to be disarmed after the surrender. And what will end up happening is that there's this kind of discussion about who will be the disarm, who will actually disarm these soldiers. And uh, what ends up happening is the U.S. suggests that the 38th parallel be used as the line that will divide the uh, soldiers to be disarmed, uh, the Japanese soldiers to be disarmed, so that the Soviet Union will accept the, dis the dis uh, surrender of Japanese soldiers north of the 38th parallel. And this is a line of lo longitude or line of latitude, rather, and the Americans will receive the surrender of Japanese soldiers to the south of the 38th parallel, right? So basically, uh, there's this promise, right, that Korea will become independent. That's the idea. But for practical reasons, Korea is divided for the surrender of Japanese soldiers with the Communist Soviet Union accepting the surrender in the north, the Americans accepting the surrender in the south, and when I say south-north, I mean north or south of the 38th parallel. And the Soviet Union accepts this, and this is, in fact, what will happen. The Soviet Union then occupies the north to accept the surrender of Japanese soldiers, but it also needs to help maintain order once the, the, there's a surrender, right? Because there was a colonial government, now it's gone. Now the Koreans were engaged in some self-government um, exercises. They were working on developing their own government. But in any case, the Soviet Union is going to occupy the North and is going to take a role in forming the government there. Now, initially, the Soviet occupation was really bad. The uh, Soviet Union treated, uh, its soldiers treated uh, the North Korean people, uh, people, nor Koreans in the North, as if they were the enemy, uh, were very, uh, treated the, the people very badly at first. Uh, they basically stole a lot and, and unfortunately committed a fairly large number of rapes against Korean women. But later on, discipline will be restored. It's not uh, Soviet policy to do this. Uh, discipline is restored. And the Soviet Union will actually prove to be very good at building up a Korean government that is pro-Soviet uh, Union, uh, pro-communist. And they will also be really good at basically making North Korea not such a bad place to be. Right? They will do a pretty good job of keeping order and of working with Koreans. And in part, one reason they're good at doing this is that there are a significant number of Koreans in the Soviet Union who speak Russian. So uh, these were basically immigrants, and they had learned to speak Russian and also, of course, spoke Korean. So while the Soviet Union's occupation of the North starts off badly, later on it will go pretty well. Things will be stabilized. And at first, there's a lot of hope because... The Soviet Union comes in and does not immediately insist on a communist government. Rather, it builds a coalition uh, a government with communists and non-communists both working together. So this is attractive uh, to many uh, Koreans, even non-communists. They say, oh, okay, we can work with this new independent government. They will then, therefore, Koreans will work with the Soviet Union to help restore order and to maintain uh, order and stability in northern Korea. 
Now, once that is done, the communists don't need the non-communists anymore, and they will increasingly take power with the help of the Soviet Union, right? So there are Korean communists. They're working with the Soviet Union. There's not enough Korean communists for them to be in charge completely, so there's this coalition government, right, uh, with between the communists and non-communists. Once, though, it's done its job, once it's gotten basic order, increasing the communists will take power over time. The center of this communist government in North Korea will end up being a man named Kim Il-sung, who we have talked about before. Uh, his rise to power is really, really closely connected to the support he received from the Soviet Union. There were other Koreans, uh, including communists, who had achieved a lot. But he, because of his connections, right, he, uh, one thing we have to stress was that he had, remember, retreated into the Soviet Union and had received protection there and had actually become a, an officer in the Soviet Army. So he was someone that the Soviet Union had experience with, thought they could trust, someone who they thought would work with them, and they were right to a large degree. And he also had a record of fighting the Japanese. So it's not like they just picked a guy who had done nothing for Korean nationalism. Right. So he will receive support from the Soviet Union. And that is key to him becoming, in a sense, in charge of North Korea. Now, the North Korean government. And one thing I really have to stress now, anytime I say North Korea, people just think of this country that just has so many problems. One of the poorest countries in the world with a terribly oppressive government. And the problem is. It wasn't all that much like that in the beginning for various reasons. In fact, for until the late 1970s, in many ways, North Korea does better than South Korea, especially economically speaking, and in terms of maintaining order. North Korea is actually going to do better than South Korea, and we have to really keep that in mind when we look at, at North Korea. So try as much as you can to forget that image we have of North Korea now. We'll try and explain later why it becomes like that. For now, I just want us to emphasize that Currently, this, this North Korea we're talking about now, the North Korea of the late 1940s, it's going to be attractive to many people. Why? Well, one thing they do is they engage in land reform, right? Uh, one advantage North Korea had, in a sense, in engaging land reform was that anyone who was pro-Japanese, who worked closely with the Japanese, the North Korean government uh, took their land and distributed it to the peasants. And this involved a lot of land. And any land that had been owned by the Japanese government directly or any kind of uh, Japanese government institution was redistributed. So this made this government very, very popular. In addition, they uh, had improved labor laws, laws that made uh, for like a 40-hour work week, laws that prevented child labor, laws that recognized unions, gave workers a lot of what they wanted. Women were given legal equality. And also there was a real effort made at increasing education. Right, especially, uh, and they were often very creative ways of helping people learn just basic literacy. Right, that's very important. There's a huge difference between being able to read and not being able to read. And North Korea made a huge effort early on to make sure that its population was learning. And one thing I have to stress: a lot of Koreans chose to go to North Korea. Right, early on during this period, you could cross the border if you wanted, and you weren't going to have any difficulty doing so. So many progressive intellectuals, for example, even if they were from southern Korea, chose to go north. So, for example, remember we talked about that modern dancer Che Sung-hee? She was someone who decided to go north, right? Unfortunately, she will be purged in 1968 and will disappear, and it turns out she died several years after that. And it's kind of a tragedy North Korea was so attractive for these reasons that a lot of these progressive intellectuals would go there and then they would fall victims to the government later on when it went off the rails. But for now, I want to emphasize that in this early period, North Korea, to a certain degree, looks attractive. It doesn't go after the, the non-communists right away, and we'll say that for later. It will engage in land reform. It will improve labor laws, bring legal equality for women, and be serious about expanding education. If you're someone who leans to the political left, this is very attractive to you, right? This is very attractive. Now, I need to talk a little bit about more about land reform. And you can see from this image, this is a, it's kind of a propaganda image, but it's uh, the flags in back say, 
basically this is the place to receive land. And there you have an old man who presumably is receiving his land. Now, land reform was non-democratic but popular, right? The government, the, the government that is ruling in North Korea does not, uh, no one elected it. They don't have a democratic basis. But that doesn't mean that things are, cannot be popular, right? This was very popular even if it was non-democratic because most people in North Korea were peasants, right? Most people in North Korea were peasants. And we have to remember a lot of these people had no experience of democracy. They didn't think much about democracy. They were just trying to survive. Remember, we talked about this earlier in Korea that if you were a peasant, that was your major focus was just trying to get food. Well, now your life just got a lot better, a lot more stable because you have land. And this led many people to support North Korea, right? If you're a peasant, this is awesome. I'm going to support North Korea. And in this time, there was very little violence. Uh, in China, when there's land reform, it's estimated that something like 1.5, 2 million people died. Not in Korea. Very few people died in the land reform. And one reason for that was because the North Koreans would just allow the people to leave. If you were a landowner, you could leave and go south. And that's a lot of times what happened. A lot of the people who uh, were targeted for losing their land, they would flee south where they could find refuge. Now, who was targeted? Well, a lot of times it was just the wealthy, people who are wealthy, Christians, as well as any kind of religious organization, uh, such as Buddhist temples, Christian churches, anyone who owned land, they could all be targeted, right? So here's the thing. This was popular among peasants because it meant taking the land away from people who had a, a good amount of land and giving it to them. But if you were one of these people, especially if you were just like a middle-class Christian, this seems really frustrating, right? You didn't do anything wrong. You just worked hard and got land, right? And so there's this kind of issue here. But a lot of these people will flee south. A lot of these wealthier people who will be targeted for, for the loss of land, a lot of Christians. And remember, we talked about earlier how Christianity was very important in developing Korean nationalism. Northern Korea actually was where most of the Christians were. Pyongyang was called the... Uh, Jerusalem of the, of, of the East because of the large number of Kore Korean Christians who live there, particularly Presbyterians. In addition, pro-Japanese collaborators were also targeted for land reform. They were people targeted to take the land away from to give to other people. And this was, of course, wildly popular because these people had profited from the Japanese um, uh, colonial period. And in particular, the Japanese... Uh, the police, the Korean police who worked for the Japanese police were really hated. And so it was very popular for their land to be taken or for them to be driven south. But I want to emphasize, right, even though there's a lot of land changing hands, a lot of lands is being taken away from these wealthier people, from Christians, from, from religious organizations, including Buddhist temples, from people who worked with the Japanese and so forth, there's not all that much violence because they're going to be allowed to flee south. And one reason they're allowed to flee south, of course, is then they're this, this south, southern Korea's problem, right? Now they've got to deal with this large population of refugees. Let them figure it out, right? And that kind of destabilizes South Korea, which North Korea is fine with doing, as we will see. The American occupation of southern Korea was, in many ways, really a mess. The Americans were really unprepared. The soldiers we moved to occupy the area were just moved there because they happened to be the closest, not because they had any uh, knowledge of Korea or anything like that. There were very few Americans who knew Korean. And so we didn't have that group of uh, Korean language speakers who the Soviet Union had they could call on. So in many ways, the Americans were just woefully unprepared. It just did not know uh, what we were really doing in a sense. And I'm not saying that to be overly critical, but it is important to understand uh, why people might choose to throw in their lot with North Korea early on, because whereas the Soviet occupation went pretty smoothly, except for that initial period, the American occupation does not go well, right? We're not prepared. And the general who is sent to be in charge of this, a man named uh, John Hodge, he was a good uh, military commander, but he was not really set out for any kind of political command. And he distrusted anyone on the political left uh, even if they were not communists, right? And this is what's tricky, was he kind of thought anyone who was on the left was like a, a communist, and he didn't like communists. He couldn't understand that there were people like, say, President Franklin Delano Roosevelt, who were on the political left, uh, but were not communists. So he distrusted anyone on the political left, um, and he wasn't really prepared. So what he did was, he decided to rely on the Japanese who were still in Korea, and 
pro-Japanese Korean officials, including the police, to help govern Korea. Right. So imagine this. The Koreans are all excited that they're finally getting rid of the Japanese. And the Americans come in and keep the Japanese and the pro-Japanese Korean uh, police working because we weren't able to take care of things ourselves and we weren't willing to trust the Koreans who had resisted Japan. Right. And a lot of resistance against Japan came from the political left. Right. So they were the ones, in a sense, who were the most anti-Japanese and theoretically could be trusted to help us. But, but instead, because uh, Hodge and the Americans in general don't trust the political left in Korea, we're going to rely on Japanese conservative Koreans. And a lot of the conservative Koreans are people who worked with the Japanese. And this includes a lot of these police who were in charge of basically beating down other Koreans. So our occupation does not go well. And there's a lot of Korean frustration and resistance with the Americans. We do have one, uh, similar to how the Soviet Union is able to turn to Kim Il-sung for assistance in, in the occupation, the United States will turn to Syngman Rhee as the best possible choice, in a sense, to be our contact in Korea. And we will promote him as a leader of Korea. Uh, a lot of Americans don't actually like Syngman Rhee, but in a sense for good reasons, because Syngman Rhee was really independently minded. He did not want Korea to become a puppet of the United States. And so while he wanted American support, he was quite willing to push the Americans in order to follow the policies that he thought were best help Korea. So Syngman Rhee, and this is one thing that makes him a little bit different from Kim Il-sung. Kim Il-sung would often do what the Soviet Union told him to do. Syngman Rhee would generally not do what the Americans told him to do, but he was our best choice uh, because he was capitalist, he was anti-communist, and he at least was willing to pay lip service to democracy. As we'll see, Syngman Rhee, unfortunately, despite starting off life as a believer in liberal democracy uh, in his political life, he is going to switch and uh, basically become a dictator. But he was a capitalist, anti-communist dictator who pretended at least to follow democracy, and that was enough for the United States. But you put all these things together, uh, Syngman Rhee, while he did have some support, doesn't have a huge amount of support because he's been outside of Korea. Uh, we're going to have a lot of chaos in South Korea. There will be active resistance, including rebellions against the South Korean government, right, that the Americans are helping to, to try and build. And to give you an idea of how bad this is, uh, there was like a rebellion in South Korea, and they sent soldiers to put down the rebellion, and the soldiers joined the rebellion. So again, this kind of forces us to, to, to rethink things. We think of South Korea as like, this is the successful Korea. North Korea, this is the unsuccessful Korea. But that's not what things look like in the late 1940s. Right. In North Korea, you have reforms that many people, including those on the non-communist left, would approve. You have relative order. It hasn't become that oppressive yet. But in the South, you know, you've got this chaos. You've got fighting. Uh, you've got a American government that is supporting uh, pro-Japanese Korean officials. So there's a lot of problems in Southern Korea. Now, what happens as the Cold War develops Right, this rivalry between the communist countries led by the Soviet Union and the capitalist liberal democracies led by the United States. Uh, that's going to lead to this increasing division, this increasing hostility between the communists and the capitalist liberal democracies. And what this means is that even though there was this Cairo Declaration back in 1943 that talked about Korea becoming independent and treated Korea as one country, there's not going to be a single unified government to govern Korea, right? The United States and the Soviet Union were supposed to work together to build a coalition government, right? That was the idea, was to work together to build a coalition government that would govern Korea. But the Soviets, of course, wanted a communist system. The Americans did not want a communist system. And so these talks will break down, right? So there, there was this attempt to build a coalition government but with the Koreans, the Soviet Union, the United States all working together, this fails. So what ends up happening is the American government takes this issue to the United Nations. It says to the United Nations, we're not able to form a coalition government, but Korea needs to be a, to have a single unified government, right? There's one Korean nation, it needs a state. So the Americans will bring this to the UN, this newly formed United Nations, and the United Nations will agree to take this on. And we'll say, well, we need to have elections. Let the Korean people determine what kind of government they want. 
Now, what will happen is the North Korean government, uh, the basically the communist government operating the North, will refuse to allow the elections to take place in the North. Right? They don't want democracy in a sense. Uh, they don't want this kind of voting democracy, and they figured that they'll probably lose because there's just not as many people in the North as they are in the South. Now, there are some irregularities in the South. It appears there was some cheating, but not a huge amount, and Re will win in the South. And so what happens is uh, Sigmund Rhee now will say, well, OK, well, we had this election for a national government in Korea. I won the election. Therefore, we can establish a government. So this will lead to the formal uh, establishment of the Republic of Korea. And that's the formal name. Uh, we often just call it South Korea, but the formal name is Republic of Korea. And the key thing is this government is born out of the United Nations. Right? These are elections supervised by the United Nations to establish a government. They don't happen in the North, but that's not the fault of the UN. Right, That's because the North would not allow them to happen. So what you have is this very odd situation where you have a government that claims to govern all of Korea, but was only elected by people in the South. But the United Nations is dedicated to protecting that government because that government was elected under elections sponsored by the United Nations, right? And if the UN cannot protect that government, cannot preserve South Korea, then no one will take the UN seriously, right? If the, this government is destroyed, if this government isn't recognized, then that's a blow against the UN because it says, look, the UN's too weak to protect this government. The North Korea will respond by formally establishing the Democratic People's Republic of Korea, the DPRK. And so we have this very dangerous situation where you have a, two governments, each of which claims to be the only representative of the same nation, right? So the Republic of Korea, South Korea says, we're the true government. We're the only legitimate government of Korea. And North Korea, the Democratic People's Republic, says, no, we're the only true government of Korea. So neither one can recognize the other, and both of them want to unify Korea under their own umbrella, under their own rule. And there's this very interesting thing going on after these elections in that Ri and Kim are going to engage in mutual provocations and so they can try and get support from their allies in order to unify the peninsula through military means. So Syngman Rhee will send forces to like attack Kim Il-sung in hopes that Kim Il-sung will launch a massive counterattack and actually invade South Korea. And then Syngman Rhee can say, hey, we're being invaded. The United States, the United Nations, help us out. Uh, Kim Il-sung wants to do the same thing. He wants to attack Syngman Rhee so that Syngman Rhee will launch like a big, big counterattack. And then Kim Il-sung can say, oh my gosh, Soviet Union, we're being attacked. Uh, come help us out. And they both hope, Rhee and Kim, to unify the country through military means and to destroy the rival government. Right. So you have a communist and anti-communist government struggling over who's going to rule a unified Korea, a Korea that will have to be unified through military means. And one thing that's fascinating is the Americans, we actually don't want to give Syngman Rhee much uh, military equipment because we're afraid that he'll try and unify uh, Korea through military means. And we don't really want war with the Soviet Union, which is what this might lead to. But of course, it is not Syngman Rhee who will invade the North. It is Kim Il-sung who will invade the South. Now, why is it that it happens that way? The big turning point is in 1949, right? In 1949, as we've already discussed in this section, the communists will win uh, victory in the Chinese Civil War, right? So you have a huge swing in favor of the communist world, right? This country that had been governed by a stridently anti-communist government is suddenly governed by a communist government. That's a big deal. That same year, the Soviet Union will, will get the nuclear bomb, right? The Soviet Union will successfully detonate a nuclear bomb that ends the American nuclear monopoly, Right before this time period, there was a war between the United States and the Soviet Union. We could drop bombs in the Soviet Union. They couldn't drop bombs on us. I mean, nuclear bombs, right? So there we have this kind of parody. That same year, the Soviet Union and China will sign a pact, uh, a security alliance, basically. And this gives Kim Il-sung a good argument to say, let's unite Korea. Now is the time to unite Korea militarily. Right now is the time to unite Korea militarily. That's what Kim Il-sung wants to do. And remember, he has connections with the Soviet Union. He'd served in the Soviet military. Uh, they were He was, in a sense, their representative. Uh, and that's why he was able to come to power in North Korea. 
It's also important to remember that he was a me- had been a member of the Chinese Communist Party. Uh, he spoke fluent Chinese, and that's a picture of Kim Il Sung on the left with Mao Zedong on the right. So he had a close relationship with Mao in that sense. So China and the Soviet Union are going to eventually agree to support Kim Il Sung in an invasion. What makes things even better for Kim Il Sung is the U.S. military will withdraw from S- South Korea based on an agreement with the Soviet Union that it will also withdraw from North Korea. But the big difference is when the U.S. leaves, we don't really leave much equipment for Sigmund Rhee. But when the Soviet Union leaves, it leaves a bunch of T-34 tanks for the North Koreans to use. In addition, North Korea will receive troops from China. Uh, There were a large number of Korean troops who had fought in the Chinese Civil War on the side of the communists. Now that the Chinese Civil War is over, those troops will be released to go back to Korea where they can then fight uh, for North Korea in order to unify the country. So in 1949, things are looking really good from the communist perspective. Uh, And they think that if Kim Il-sung were to invade South Korea with all those tanks, he could easily run over the South Korean army and very quickly uh, unite the peninsula before the United States or the United Nations could do anything. And that was basically the strategy. Let's launch, or and I say let's, I mean Kim Il-sung, the China and Soviet Union aren't involved at this point militarily. Kim Il-sung is going to launch a massive invasion with those tanks and hopefully knock out uh, the South Korean army and unify the country before the United Nations and the United States can do anything about it. 